Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Alrighty, boys. Let's do it. How's it going, gentlemen? And ladies, trying to get better at that. All are welcome. Unless you don't want to learn about history, then... If you're not ready to learn, there's the door. You're in the wrong class. Home ec is down the hall. Go make me... Pop-Tart. I gotta learn how to cook. I guess I should go to Home Ec. Woodshop, though. Woodshop was great. I loved Woodshop. I have ADD. Okay. Not the best learner. I have the attention span of a stump. But I'm working on it. Let's go. Original link to the video, top of the description below, right below that, link to the Discord. Click on that, it'll send you right over there. Helps create the atmosphere I want to create on YouTube and his... The atmosphere I want to create around history on YouTube and Discord. There we go. Pull up a chair, my friend. Love to have you. More the merrier. My name's Connor, by the way. If I didn't already introduce myself. Nice to meet you, sir or madam. Let's go. Playing the victim, historical revisionism, revisionism, and Japan. Great start. Let's go. If I asked you to name as many movies and video games as you could where Nazis were the bad guys, you could probably come up with at least a dozen before you even had to take a breath. But if I were to ask you to do the same thing for Japan, you'd probably struggle. Aside from the greatest movie ever made and maybe one of the Call of Duties, they is he being sarcastic? I thought Pearl Harbor was a terrible... I'm going to pause right here, but I, I don't... I have a lot of um, opinions on this on this subject. I, I, I'll I promise you I'll try not to pause too much throughout the video. It's 24 minutes long, but... I think the big reason is, like, if you were to ask China, I mean, I, I'd, I'd imagine China has Japan much more as the bad guy than Germany. I, I think that in the West... The major Western enemy was Germany and the Nazis, and you know America also fought against the Japanese. But and so I think that's mainly the reason they're just more recognizable when people think of Nazis versus Imperial Japan. You know, Nazi definitely rings a bell. But I absolutely I would recommend if you don't get too um, nightmared ish or whatever. But Joseph Mengele has nothing on what i forget what the japanese the perfect example i remember the really bad doctor nazi doctor but i i blanking on the name of the japanese doctor but he makes him look like you know kindergarten compared to what um the japanese did you know the death camps it's like how can you get worse than a death camp and the twin experiments and stuff like that um go take a look at what imperial japan did um, to, in in Manchuria, uh, a lot of people know about the rape of Nanking, but some awful, awful stuff. So let's get started. I think that's mainly why, though. I think we just think of Nazis first. They aren't really Here. portrayed as evil in our popular media. There actually is one Call of Duty, but unless you're a diehard fan, I bet you can't even name it. This is despite the fact that they killed almost as many people as the Nazis during World War II. So why is that? I did that as a kid. I'm such an idiot. I took a pair of tweezers. And I'm just like, oh, what would this do? And I remember my grandpa was... <laughs> Jesus. As with most stories about World War II, we need to go back several decades to get the full picture. We're going to start the clock in 1868 with the Meiji Restoration, when the Emperor of Japan became the supreme leader of the government. Before that, it flip-flopped between the Shogun and the Emperor. Who am I kidding? We've all seen Bill Wirtz's video, and if you haven't, you should, because I'm going to reference it several times. In 1890, the Meiji Constitution was adopted, which set up a Western-style government with a parliament, a prime minister, and a monarch. Very similar to what Great Britain has today. 
today. For several decades before this, Japan was a closed off, isolated country. But now they wanted to burst onto the world stage quite literally with a bang. China had always been the dominant power in Asia, and since Japan borrowed so much of its culture and language from China, they kind of felt like a little brother. China was to Japan what Great Britain was to the United States. And like a younger brother, when they matured a bit, they decided to test out their strength against the elder, which- That's such a good analogy. I feel like the US is always trying to like, hey, Great Britain, see, look what I did resulted in the first Sino-Japanese War in 1894. To sum it up into a single sentence, this war was over who would control Korea, and Japan won. They had beaten their older brother in their first real fight. However, Japan also captured the Liaodong Peninsula, just north of Korea. It previously belonged to China, who was leasing Port Arthur to Russia. Now that the Japanese controlled it, they offered to extend the lease to Russia if Russia recognized Korea as belonging to Japan. Russia refused, wanting to exert their own influence on Korea. So in 1904, the Russo-Japanese War started when Japan surprise attacked the Russian Navy in Port Arthur. This is apparently a recurring strategy for Japan. Long story short, Japan won, which was a pretty big deal. This was the first time an Asian power had defeated a European power since the Mongols. Ten years later, World War I started, and... I'm not entirely sure it should be called a world war since it was fought almost entirely in Europe. German-held territories in the Pacific, of which there were many, all fell to the Allied forces in the first six months or so. The rest of the war would go on for another four years. Japan was one of those Allied forces, having captured several islands and ports from the Germans. So when it came time to negotiate the Treaty of Versailles, they got to sit at the table with everyone else. Can you even find him? There he is. Yeah, Japan didn't really take kindly to being relegated to the end of the table and basically forgotten, because, you know. Japan is all about the respect. They just defeated China and Russia and now Germany. They felt they should be treated with the same respect as all of the other world powers. And much like a younger brother with a chip on their shoulder, when they felt disrespected by their allies, they stomped off to their room and plotted their revenge. Japan's role in World War I was fairly minimal. There was some action in the first few months, but then they mostly played a support role. Their manufacturing and military industries took off during the war because they were one of the only allied nations not digging trenches in their backyard. So the economy was booming and their population soared. But then the war ended and people stopped buying Japanese goods. And then the Great Depression happened and people stopped buying Japanese goods even harder. Japan had convinced itself that it was the target of a global conspiracy to crash its economy. Things were going great during the war, and now that the world was at peace, things were making a turn for the worse, which is the opposite of what you would expect. So nationalism started to take hold, much like it did in European countries at the time. Why is the economy so bad? Because of terrible trade deals and a global conspiracy against us and a lack of the respect that we deserve. This should sound familiar. Draw whatever parallels you like. Japanese schools started to... Sorry, I don't know why I'm blinking so much. My left eye is just really dry. Push for deserve. This should sound familiar. Draw whatever parallels you like. Japanese schools started to push for conformity, obedience, and ultra-patriotism. Many school teachers were former soldiers and ran their classrooms like boot camp. There are even stories of teachers who killed themselves out of shame for messing up the words to patriotic songs. Again, draw whatever parallels you like. But perhaps worst of all was the indoctrination of the idea of Japanese racial superiority. The Nazis recognized the Japanese as the Asian master race which is why they eventually entered into an alliance with them. The Japanese still saw the Chinese as somewhat of an older brother, but the Koreans were the red-headed stepchild. Now Japan had a new problem. In order to feed their expanding population, they needed more land and Resources. I wish I was joking, but they actually called it Manifest Destiny and invaded China in 1931. Except it wasn't really China, it was Manchuria, which was kinda sorta part of China. Kinda. Maybe I can help? Please. You're right. Most carefully worded historical resources will call the Japanese offensive between 1931 and 1932 the invasion of Manchuria, not the invasion of China. Who's this? He sounds familiar and I recognize the map. Because China was not one unified political entity at the time. With the collapse of the Qin Dynasty in 1912, the country had split Swim into me. numerous states ruled by warlords called cliques, who fought both with and against each other in shifting alliances. The Republican Kuomintang under Chiang Kai-shek and the Socialist Chinese Communist Party united to fight the warlords but soon started fighting each other beginning the Chinese Civil War. The Fengtian clique ruled most of the area we call Manchuria and it was this state that the Japanese invaded in 1931 because of the vast economic and military ties they had to the region. 
The invasion of China is a name reserved for the offensive in 1937 because it was the first time Japan had invaded a territory actually controlled by the Republic of China politically. However, both invasions were done under fabricated incidents of Chinese aggression, such as the Mukden incident and the Marco Polo Bridge incident, respectively, betraying Japanese obvious military interests in crushing the Chinese rule in the area. If you'd like to learn more, check out my History of China series over at the Sweeney channel when you're done here. As I always call it Swibney, Sweeney. If you'd like to learn more, check out my History of China series over at the Sweeney channel when you're done here. As he said, in 1937, the Marco Polo Bridge incident occurred, which was the beginning of the Second Sino-Japanese War. And depending on who you ask, the beginning of World War II. There are obviously dozens, if not hundreds of battles to talk about here, but battle history isn't really my thing, so Blame let's just focus nuns. on two. The Battle of Shanghai started in August 1937. While Japan still viewed China as an elder civilization and still held them in somewhat high regard, they expected Shanghai to fall quickly. China was broken and fighting amongst itself, and Japan was clear clearly superior, at least in their minds, but it didn't. The Chinese held out for three months until November 1937 when they retreated to Nanking. The Japanese pursued them for all 200 miles, absolutely obliterating anyone and anything along the way. The city of Suchow, which is on the road between Shanghai and Nanking, went from 350,000 people to just 500. Single cities in China suffered as many casualties as entire countries in Europe. If you remember Bill Wirtz's video, what? here's where he talks about the Japanese advance. Japan invaded more and more and more and more of China. Did you catch it? I bet you didn't because you probably had annotations turned off. Here it is again with them turned on. Japan invaded more and more and more and more of China. And they did some rapes. What a wonderfully light-hearted way to put that. And as an annotation, which means it wasn't much more than an afterthought. So let's talk about Nanking, which was the capital of China at the time. Chiang Kai-shek pulled the government and air force out of the city and ordered the skeleton crew of troops to hold Nanking at all costs. It was pretty clear to the soldiers that he had left them for dead. But being the capital of China, it was still a fairly important political prize for Japan, so the emperor appointed his uncle, Prince Osaka, to lead the charge. This becomes incredibly important later. The siege and battle of Nanking lasted for four days in the beginning of the prize for Japan, so the emperor appointed his uncle, Prince Osaka, to lead the charge. This becomes incredibly important later. The siege and battle of Nanking lasted for four days in the beginning of December 1937. Remember, Shanghai lasted three months. The Chinese soldiers left in the city either ran, surrendered, or tore off their military uniforms and looted stores, homes, or even random people on the street in order to steal their clothes and hide among the civilian population. The Japanese who entered the city had a completely different mindset. They felt humiliated after Shanghai and were looking for revenge. At the same time, they were absolutely disgusted by the soldiers who were surrendering. One of the main tenets of the Japanese warrior code, or Bushido, is death before dishonor. There is nothing more shameful than surrendering. Among Western military powers, there was one surrender for every three dead. Among the Japanese, there was one surrender for every 120 dead. They just didn't. I'm surprised it was, I thought it might have been even higher, like one in... A thousand. In the Japanese, there was one surrender for every 120 dead. They just didn't do it. This like, so I'm pausing again, I'm sorry, but I said this in another video, and if I was a soldier, I've never been a soldier, never served in the military, but there, I will never forget, well, I love watching World War II documentaries well before I created a channel, and the most terrifying thing isn't, wouldn't be seeing an intimidating thing, wouldn't be seeing what another opposing male soldier enemy soldier does whether it be suicide bomb or kamikaze attack it would be how the civilians act and there was this one video where i guess they 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 the japanese made uh the civilians believe that that if they got not only is surrender a complete dishonor and you should do anything for the emperor but that if they got captured they would be like eaten or something and, and so a, a mother just has her baby and just jumps off a cliff like not like oh my god this is a tough decision uh uh jump but just like a walk in the park well there are the americans uh the japanese lost this island time to jump off the cliff boom and seeing that would terrify me more than anything because if a mother young mother and baby with her baby is willing to do that then imagine imagine how hard male soldiers are going to fight so 
This was compounded by the fact that the Chinese outnumbered the Japanese 7 to 2. Journals from Japanese soldiers at the time wondered, why are they surrendering? Even unarmed, they could overpower us. The Chinese were cowards in the eyes of the Japanese, and the only explanation they could come up with was that they were subhuman. Once they took the city, things only got worse. Prince Asaka, or one of his subordinates, issued a kill all captives order. The stated reason was to preserve food. Gee, where have I heard that one before? All 90,000 Chinese soldiers, now prisoners of war, were killed. Every military aged male in the city was killed. In fact, almost everybody in the city was killed. If I asked you to come up with a list of 100 ways to kill a person, you still wouldn't even come close to what the Japanese did. Prisoners, 100 ways to kill. Shoot in the head, shoot in the chest, stab in the head, stab in the heart, thousand cuts, nickel back, poison drown, burn, strangle, snoo snoo kill a person, you still wouldn't even come close to what the Japanese did. Prisoners were used for bayonet and machine gun practice. Officers ordered new recruits to kill unarmed prisoners in order to break them in and desensitize them to war. Those are just the nice ways. I hope you're not eating right now because it's about to get a whole lot I heard worse. They would Chinese were lined up in babies. rows and beheaded. They even made contests out of it where officers would compete to see who could behead 100 Chinese the fastest. These contests were reported in Japanese newspapers in the same way you'd read about a baseball game. After they were beheaded, the row behind them would push them into the mass grave that they dug themselves, and then they were beheaded and pushed in by the row behind them. And that's if you were lucky. There are cases of the Chinese being forced to bury their countrymen up to their neck alive, and then they were buried up to their neck alive. Bodies were used to fill in trenches so that tanks could drive across. People were forced to drink kerosene and then shot so that they exploded. People were forced to walk out on the ice. Babies were impaled on bayonets or thrown into to boiling pots of water. Yes, that is a real picture. You wouldn't have believed me otherwise. It's censored for obvious reasons. Basically every way that you could possibly think of to kill a person, and then some. At least 200,000 people were killed, which was half of the population of Nanking at the time. This is why the event is known as the- I knew about that, and I didn't know about the boiling pot. I knew about, you know, the skewering, and still just hearing him saying it and seeing the picture is jarring and- insane were killed which was half of the population of nanking at the time this is why the event is known as the nanking massacre but it's also known perhaps more appropriately as the rape of nanking do you have any notion of what happens when a city is sacked the japanese raped every woman they could find i hope you have a strong stomach because between 20 and 80 000 women were raped why does that number have such a large range because after women were raped by anywhere from 15 to 20 soldiers each they were killed and their bodies were left in the street with bayonets stuck in them. Again, censored for obvious reasons, I'm not making this up. Why were they killed? Well, rape was explicitly forbidden in the Japanese military, but dead women tell no tales. Asian cultures value chastity and purity, so many surviving women just never spoke about it or killed themselves out of shame. To this day, no woman will admit that her child may have been born to a Japanese soldier, and infanticide was rampant during the occupation. And if you think that's the worst of it, you're still wrong. At gunpoint, Chinese fathers were forced on their daughters, sons on their mothers, Basically every combination that you've looked up on Pornhub. I'm so done trying to understand millennials. There were rape contests as well, but honestly, even I have my limits, so we're done talking about this. You might be thinking, how have I never heard about this? This must have been carried out in secret or something. No, this was front page news at the time. There were a number of foreigners in the city, including reporters, business, this was front page. The destruction of Nanking was the blackest page in modern history, according to George Fitch, who was director of the safety zone in Nanking from December 3rd to February 20th, and an eyewitness of the destruction of, of the city by the Japanese. Page news at the time. There were a number of foreigners in the city, including reporters, businessmen, and ambassadors. This was the capital of China, after all. These foreigners established the Nanking Safety Zone, a two and a half square mile area reserved for civilians that was 
supposed to be safe from the Japanese military. Many former Chinese soldiers hid in the zone and were subsequently captured, so the military justified regularly raiding the zone. It eventually sheltered 250,000 refugees and was maintained by just two dozen foreign nationals led by John Robb, the official Nazi party representative to Nanking. Nazi Germany was allied with Japan. He had every reason to portray Japan in a positive light, but he didn't. His letters and journals from the time tell the gruesome story of how thousands Thousands of last night up to 1,000. Wait, women were raped and thousands more were murdered. He would walk this of how last night up to 1,000 women and girls are said to have been raped. You hear nothing but rape. If husbands or brothers intervene, they're shot. What you hear and see on all sides is the brutality and bestiality of the Japanese soldiers. How thousands of women were raped. Isn't bestiality sex with animals? Am I pronouncing that wrong? Or did they do that too, or? And thousands more were murdered. He would walk the streets at night and stop rapes in progress, like a Nazi Batman, but his only superpower was his swastika armband. The idea of a good guy Nazi is just so weird that you couldn't make this up if you tried. That Upon is his just, that, that right there is just, should just show you how bad Japan was during the war. That put Nazis over there and they, even they, are like, okay, no, 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 no. To return to Germany, the Gestapo ordered him to never speak of Nanking again. He's celebrated as the Oscar Schindler of Nanking and there are multiple memorials to him in the city today. This lasted for six weeks. Reporters were barred entry to the city and it didn't take long for foreign governments to figure out why. Then the stories started coming out. There were very few media depictions of this incident, but this one called Flowers of War came out in 2011 and starred Christian Bale. They definitely put some coin into this one so it's out in 2011 and starred Christian Bale. I'm pausing a lot. I don't care. All right. Get off. Go off the whatever. I'm just, I, there, this is a crazy video. Bale. They definitely put some coin into this one, so it's worth giving a watch. Had I not read about this event prior to seeing the movie, I would have thought this was an exaggeration. They even go through the effort to recreate several of the iconic photographs of the massacre, including this one, which we saw earlier. Towards his credit, he does mention the rape of Nanking in his history of the entire world, I guess. Japan is finally conquering the East, and they're so excited they raped Nanking way too hard. They should probably just deny it. We'll get to the denial in a bit, but this event, along with the accidental sinking of the USS Panay in Nanking during the evacuation turned US opinion against Japan. But the final straw was when Japan invaded Indochina in 1940. The United States Philippine. decided to cease all shipments of oil as well as other goods to Japan and ban them from using the Panama Canal. Japan's Sorry, but is, does the US still own the Philippines or have control over the Philippines, I guess own, uh, in, during World War II? as well as other goods to Japan and ban them from using the Panama Canal. Japan's response to this was... But then Japan spits on them in Hawaii and challenges them to war. And they say yes. An event he leaves out of his history of the entire world, despite how important it is. And despite the fact that it wasn't just Pearl Harbor. They attacked dozens of islands in the Pacific all on the same day in order... Is he like getting on Bill Wirtz? Like saying, because Bill Wirtz is trying to describe everything in, in as quick as a way as possible. He can't stop and go into every detail to secure their own sources of oil. I made a video about this. Pearl Harbor was just where the U.S. Pacific Fleet was based, so it's the one that got the most attention. The attack was designed to stall U.S. response long enough for Japan to fortify its other positions, which worked actually for a little while. Again, I don't want to get into the specific battles of the war, but I do want to talk about the prisoners of war. As I said before, the Japanese rarely, if ever, surrendered, but for Western militaries, surrender was a perfectly acceptable option. At the beginning of this video, if you were able to name any movies about Japan in World War II, one of them was probably the 1957 or, movie or, Bridge or, on the or. River Kwai, starring Obi-Wan Kenobi. And maybe you knew about the 2014 movie Unbroken. Both of these movies are about the hells on earth that were Japanese POW camps. Of American POWs in Nazi Germany, one out of every 25 died in a camp. Of American POWs in Japan, one in three. They surrendered. In the eyes of Japan, they were dishonorable cowards. And they are enemies of Japan. You will be treated.
you will be treated accordingly. The infamous Bataan Death March in 1942 was the forced relocation of between 60 and 80,000 American and Filipino POWs over 70 miles. It's also referred to as the POW Trail of Tears, which is an apt comparison because just as many people died. In an act of perpetual defiance, the march is repeated annually at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. So let's skip ahead and end the war. Bonus round, Pacific Showdown, United States versus Japan, fight! fight, fight. Finish him. I don't want to get into whether or not it was right to use the bombs, but I will say that destroying cities wasn't all that new. We'd been firebombing cities for a while at that point. This was Tokyo. Again, I made a video about this. So if I were to tell you that this was done by a single bomb, you'd think I was lying. And Rightfully so, because that one's actually Tokyo. The first one was Hiroshima. The point is that you couldn't tell the difference. So when we told Japan, we are in possession of the most destructive explosive ever devised by man, their response was, yeah. Sure you are, buddy. Because we had been leveling cities for some time. So we dropped a second one to force an unconditional surrender without having to invade mainland Japan. United States installed a new government, inspired by the United States government. Whoa, whoa, wait. And they did some rapes? Rapes did occur in occupied Japan. But to use the same whoops and they did some rapes tone to suggest that it was anywhere near the same scale as Nanking is just intellectually dishonest. It was measured in the hundreds, not the tens of thousands. This, along with playing up the horrors of the atomic bombs, helps paint a sympathetic picture of Japan as a victim of the war rather than an aggressor, along with a few other subtle narrative changes, like that the war was to free Asia from Western imperialism and not world domination, and Pearl Harbor was just a reaction to being backed into a corner and not an aggressive land grab. Those really are the versions of history being taught in Japan today. And that's only Recently, for decades after the war, Japanese schools didn't even teach that Japan and the US were at war. Or who won. But there's something else I want to say about that segment. United States installed a new government, inspired by the United States government. No, we didn't. Firstly, it was much more inspired by the constitutional monarchy that Great Britain has, and secondly, there's very little new about it. All of the positions are the same. The emperor is still the emperor, the parliament still exists, even the the current day prime minister is the 63rd prime minister. We've only had 45 presidents. The position goes all the way back to the Meiji restoration. And while all of the positions stayed the same, Shinzo Abe, I'm, this is probably a few years ago, the video, but he's, there's a new guy, right? So did many of the faces. The 56th prime minister of Japan was previously being held as a class A war criminal. To put that into perspective, there's nothing higher than class A. If Hitler was captured alive, he would have been a class A war criminal. This is why Nazis are always the bad guys in our World War II media and not Japan. Nazis don't exist anymore or at least they're not in charge of anything anymore. There's a clear disconnect between Nazi Germany and present day Germany. But if you make Imperial Japan the bad guys, you are by extension making current day Japan the bad guys. Everything about the government and most of the people in it were the same. Many class B and C war criminals, including- Wait, current day Japan? As in, are you telling me people who were in charge of Japan back then are-, are... Eh lower level and most of the people in it were the same. Many class B and C war criminals, including lower level officers and soldiers, were tried by the Nanking War Crimes Tribunal, and many of the foreign nationals who administered the Nanking Safety Zone testified against them. The two lieutenants who participated in that 100 beheadings contest were tried there as well, and their defense was, and I wish I was joking here, it was only like 70 people. Weirdly, that didn't work and they were found guilty and executed. One of the lower level generals was also tried but blamed the massacre on Koreans, which also didn't work and he was executed. The but crazy most of the doctor, class A were like crazy like jo Joseph Mengele version but in Japan um, for his test results, experiments on people, I believe he was pardoned or something if he gave it to the U.S. Criminals were tried in Tokyo by the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, or just IMTFE for short. While the IMTFE found that the Nanking Massacre was secretly ordered or willfully committed, they weren't allowed to prosecute the top commander who, if you remember, was Prince Asaka, because the entire imperial family was given immunity by Douglas MacArthur. This infuriated the Chinese, but at least they could go after the other high-level officials. Until 1949, when Mao seized control of mainland China and the bamboo curtain fell on Asia. Is that racist? That feels racist. Then the Korean War happened and the West How needed a- racist? Non-communist ally in Asia, so the IMT- 
PFE just sort of stopped. This was when the future prime minister was let off the hook and was allowed to continue being a politician, as long as he was pro-American. While present-day Germany paid war reparations, Japan never really had to. And since the chief culprits of the rape of Nanking never stood trial, Sino-Japanese relations were sour for decades. Eventually, the governments of both Communist China and the Republic of China forgave Japan in order to open up trade relations which infuriated Chinese citizens. Japan has never formally apologized for any of its war crimes. The United States helped with that cover-up narrative. How do you convince millions of citizens that the people that they just fought a few years ago were now our friends? Mostly by repeatedly apologizing for and playing up the horrors of the atomic bombs. Because, you know, two wrongs make a right. They cancel each other out. If you look at history, recently, we have bombed the masculinity out of an entire continent. There's a lot of hypocrisy going on here, I think, between the U.S. And, like, I, I see a lot of it in the, in the Japanese sort of effort saying, you know, manifest destiny. And uh, what was the other thing? But like, has maybe they should apologize, but has America gone to Ghana, to Togo, Benin, to, to Ivory Coast, to Nigeria, to, to Cameroon, to Sierra Leone, Liberia? To, have we gone to every single one of those places and apologized for slavery to every one of those places? Has I, I'm not trying to... I don't have to say this. Of course I'm not defending what Japan did, just like I wouldn't Nazis did, just like I wouldn't Americans did with slavery. This is much more recent, and so it, the wound is much more open. But I there's a lot of... like. Um, how could Japan not, uh, like the people of Japan not apologize today? I'm saying what I feel, all right? I'm not, a, it's like, they, of course, the leader, like Hirohito, he died, what, like in, in like 1980 or 79 or something like that, apologizing, but, um, some hypocrisy oh, going because, on. Because, you know, two wrongs make a right. They Let cancel me know each other wrong. out. If you look at history, recently, we have bombed the masculinity out of an entire continent. We dropped two atomic bombs on Japan and they've been drawing Hello Kitty and shit ever since. As funny as that is, he's also Chappelle. not wrong. Hello Kitty, Karobi, and more recently Gudetama were all created by Sanrio to play into the victimization and pacification of Japan. They are all designed to look vulnerable. All of these characters are just so cute and defenseless and you just want to hug and protect them. Oh my it's also known as kawaii culture and it really grew during the 70s and 80s. So you want them to All right, if that's if that's I like this channel. This guy's got some good points, but there there is a part of him that I'm like what you want him you want all of the things to be devils and like like dead babies as their dolls and stuff. Like what exactly do you want them 80s, but continues today. Then the Cold War ended and the stories came out. Japanese soldiers who no longer feared prosecution talked openly about what Again, they did. Again, guys, let me know if I'm wrong. I'll change my opinion with more evidence. I'm just saying what's on my mind. Let me know if I'm wrong. In your opinion. Books were published like Iris Chang's The Rape of Nanking and movies were made like Flowers of War and Unbroken. And still Japan, at least officially anyway, denies their role in the tragedy, saying it was all just Soviet and Chinese propaganda. Which is kind of true by the way, even some blaming the United States for it, which... Or saying it was only 3,000 people who were killed, even though there are single mass graves with more bodies than that. Or that it was Chinese looters, or all the women who were raped were actually paid prostitutes or comfort women, which is the same reason Korean-Japanese relations are still on the rocks. The Japanese government thinks that apologizing for the sins of the past would be an insult to veterans. Those responsible have already been prosecuted. How many times must they apologize? Once would be nice, you know, for starters, I mean, having ridiculous. any sort of academic or political discussion on Japanese war crimes in Japan usually results in career suicide, and more often than not, death threats. Whenever a Japanese politician makes the mistake of apologizing in a personal capacity, not an official one, they either retract it shortly afterwards or are voted out. The current Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, made that mistake in 2006, and now repeatedly claims that comfort women weren't forced into sexual slavery but were private entrepreneurs. On a visit to 
to the Yakasuni Shrine, which memorializes over a thousand convicted war criminals, 14 of which are Class A, he said, The men convicted by the Allied tribunals are not war criminals under the laws of Japan. Japanese denial of their war crimes, and especially Nan not war criminals under the laws of Japan. Japanese denial of their war crimes, and especially Nanking, is akin to denying that the Holocaust happened. The most successful historical revisions are those that only tell one side. But in recent That's years, we've started true. to hear the other sides of this story, and it's important to listen. The saying goes, those who do not learn from their history- so Like saying that slavery never happened in the US or Brazil or- they are doomed to repeat it. You no longer have the luxury of saying you didn't learn because now you know better. I so yeah, the thing about apologizing for it when you weren't there, it's like me, it's like... It just seems disingenuine, you know? I think recognizing that it happened and that this is what human beings are capable of doing I think that pointing pointing fingers at citizens alive today that had nothing to do with these things, whether it be no one's alive today that had anything to do with slavery uh, in the U.S., but um, Germans in Europe or um, uh, Japanese um, about uh, the stuff in World War II, it, to me, it, it the reason that sort of gets under my skin is that I, the 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 term should be acknowledging it, not apologizing for what you didn't do. It is acknowledging things makes it so history won't, won't repeat itself. And I think we need to look at this as a problem of human beings and, and a warning of what every one of us can become. I think that is the honest take, the honest take and direction we have to go in when thinking about this stuff is that look at what humans can do, not Hey, Japan, Germany, apologize. You know, like right now, you apologize. You person who was born in 1994, apologize for the rape of Nanking. I think that is absurd. I think that that a, hey, German, you who were born in 2001, apologize to the Jewish community right now. Or American, me, apologize for slavery to every black person in America and Brazil and Caribbean and Africa. What's important is acknowledging that it happened, never forgetting that it happened, and always knowing that it could happen again, ward against it, and realize that how disgusting and evil human beings can become under certain influences and circumstances. That's how I feel. I promise I'd make this video almost two years ago. All right, guys. Great video. One of the recommendations. See you next time.